I, in my opinion, it's a game changer as far as the as far as the FACO emulsification is concerned. And it is because of the capsular excess, we are able to put the lens in the bag. We are able to do the FACO emulsification in the bag away from the corneal endothelium, unlike the way the Charles Kelman did in the anterior chamber of FACO. Capsular excess for better visibility, prevent corneal stray, pivot the instrument around the incision, prevent cortex disturbance, engage the capsule, do not perforate. If you perforate, perforate all the cortex will start coming out and it will hinder the view of the capsule. Maintain the good re re red reflex, keep the highball horizontal, prevent the capsular flap from getting crumbled up. So these are the more four important steps you have to do for the capsular excess. Excess through a side port is always better because the chamber stability is better. Use a 26 gauge needle or you can use a 27 gauge needle also. Use a shearing technique. Keep the anterior chamber deep. Conclude the tear from outside in. Like a pier. You can see here the capsular excess size about 5.25 to 5.5 millimeter. I'm using a trepan blue in a case of a, uh, this thing. If you want, even in immature cataract, you can use a trepan blue as, as well. There are capsular excess markers, which is made by a company called Epsilon, wherein you just press it on the cornea, you know exactly what is the size of the capsular excess. I use routinely the markerless system which is there on the Callisto or the Virion. The Virion is attached to the Alcon, the Callisto is attached to the Zeiss. <clears throat> you can see here, this Callisto is attached to the IOL Master, the Virion is attached to the Lens Star, and how the capsular excess makes it very easy because there's a mark on the surface of the cornea, which will give you an idea of exactly what is the size of the excess you want to. Basic capsular excess, if you want, you can stain the capsule with a trepan blue, deepen the chamber with gel, either a Helon or a HPMC or a Viscoat or whatever you are comfortable. Perform the excess. Always put the trepan blue under the air, <laughs> under the bubble of air, because if you put the bubble of air, there is a beautiful surface tension on the surface of the capsule and the trepan blue spreads over the surface of the anterior capsule in uniformity. Perform the excess with the forceps or needle. Either as I told you, you can use a 26 gauge needle or you can use a micro rexis forceps or ultrata forceps or you can use even a side port micro rexis forceps as well. Stain the capsule, deepen the chamber with the gel, perform the rexis with the forceps or needle. Visualize. This is a very important thing. Unless you visualize the anterior capsule, you will make mistakes. So you need to visualize the anterior capsule very, very nicely. Make sure that you do not very overconfident while doing the capsular excess. Within a millisecond, the capsular excess can go to the periphery, especially when you are in the zonular area. So visualize clearly. Adjust the microscope, the IPD, the interpupillary diameter, the illumination of the microscope, and fine focus. Always make sure that you have the coaxial illumination of the microscope because you need a good red glow for the, for the capsular excess as well. Tilt the eyes slightly to get a good view. Replace the gel to see the better, to see much better. As I told you, the deep chamber is a safe chamber as far as capsular excess is concerned. A shallow chamber is a very dangerous place. If you have a shallow chamber, if the viscoelastic escapes, there's a possibility that the rexis can go to the periphery and you can lose the rexis and this is one of the very common causes. So now and then you need to come out of the eye and fill the chamber, make sure that the anterior chamber is deep throughout the surface or throughout the procedure of the capsular rexis till the rexis is complete. You can see here, I'm going to the right and then I'm creating what is called a guide flap. And then I'm going anti-clockwise. You can go either clockwise or anti-clockwise. 
making sure that the needle does not press the posterior lip of the incision. If you press the posterior lip, the viscoelastic will come out, the AC will shallow, and the capsular resistance will start going to the periphery. Again, you can see here how I am doing the rexis here with the, with the capsular excess forceps in a white mature cataract. I am using the tripan blue and again making sure the anterior chamber is deep throughout the capsular excess procedure. Again, another patient, you can see here the needle I am going again. That is called the guide flap, what you see. And that guide flap, you either you rotate it, either you go, if since I'm going to the right, I go anti-clockwise and making sure that you do a shearing technique and try to make a round capsular axis, as much as centric, as much as round capsular axis, and preferably size of about 5 or 5.25 or 5.5 millimeter depending on whatever type of lens you're going to put. Just to show you, a rexis in a posterior polar cataract, I aim always for about 5 millimeter, because in, in the case of a posterior capsule rent, you can always put the lens in the, in the sulcus and capture the lens in the back. I'm using a micro capsule rexis forceps, and every time I see, you can see here, I do what is called regrasp the capsule rexis margin. Always catch the base of the capsular axis and not the tip of the capsular axis margin. That is very important. You can see here how I am trying to do that. And during the entire procedure, the anterior chamber is very deep. And always make sure that you don't depress the posterior lip of the incision. If you depress the posterior lip of the incision, then you can have problem of escaping the of the of the viscoelastic escaping in the anterior chamber becoming shallow and the rexis can go to the periphery. What are the challenging situations? You can have a small pupil. If you have a small pupil, then you will not be able to give the, see the rexis very clearly. The red reflex is also not very clear. Hyper mature cataract, no red reflex. Infantile capsule is always very highly elastic and it can start extending to the periphery. Small pupil just proceed with the rexis a little beyond the margins of the pupil. Make a pear shaped rexis, an extension that permits phaco multiplication. You can see how I'm doing the rexis under the pupillary margin. So I'm making a guide flap and then I'm injecting viscoelastic, preferably viscoat there, and then trying to catch the base of the capsular rexis margin and always seeing the margin of that capsular axis underneath the or what is called following the margin or the course of the capsular axis this thing uh, uh, underneath the pupil as well so in, in which case when we have a small pupil always you can make a axis which is slightly larger than the size of the pupil as well just to show you another case wherein a axis underneath the pupillary margin requires a little bit of experience Always follow the margin of the rexis. You can see here the margin of the rexis. Always hold, as I told you, re-grasp every three clock hours. And once you make sure that the rexis is complete, then you can do the hydro dissection. So this is again a small pupil. You can use, use an iris stretch, iris hooks, multiple spintrotomies, sector idectomy. All these you can do before you do the capsular rexis. But normally when these are people who very small, I always use the iris retractor or the iris hooks and then go ahead with the capsular axis. If it's too small a axis, it's very difficult to do the phaco. Discontinuity of the capsular tear, a tear that extends the zonules if you go beyond the 7 millimeter zonules. If you have a small axis like this, you can have capsular phimosis and this capsular phimosis can progress rapidly post-operatively and can produce a folding of the lens as well and backward shift of the lens and hyperopy shift in the in this thing. In this case, I had to do a YAG laser capsulotomy on both sides to relieve the capsular phimosis in this case. Again, an escaping rexis. When the rexis goes to the periphery, the zonal area, 
you have no control absolutely you can see here this rexis has gone to the periphery then i'm injecting viscoelastic and this where viscoelastic like this coat will go and stay there and then i'm trying to pull it towards the center and always the pull has to be towards the center towards the center of the pupil or what we call as centripetal so this is again a very important thing to, for you to notice two smaller rexis you can do what is called a double rexis continue in a spiral fashion and enlarge it do a two stage enlargement before you do the phaco emulsification and making sure that you don't have capsular phimosis post operatively discontinuity of the capsular tear proceed with the phaco avoid undue stress and tear, tear the rexis into zonules danger zone safe zone safe zone is, uh, is right in the center danger zone is the periphery don't stop if you that is towards the rexis if it is on the opposite direction you have to be very careful if it is very dense cataract i would always advise you to convert because there is a possibility of the rexis extending across the equator into the posterior capsule do out of the bag phaco emulsification if it is a fairly soft cataract Kelman always did it this way. If you have a rexis tear, making sure that if you are in the bag, what has happened is there will be stress on the capsular bag, stress on the zonules, stress on the posterior capsule as well. Capsular phimosis, you can have post-string contraction. Viscoelastic can get incarcerated and produce post-operative inflammation as well. Small pupils. no red reflex hypermature cataracts we'll see that the different types of white cataract how to do the capsular rexis we have the three types of white cataracts the type 1 is the intermittent white cataracts type 2 is mature white cataracts and type 3 is hypermature white cataracts among this the type 1 is the more most important the most dangerous as far as argentina flag sign is concerned and the type 3 is hypermature sclerotic cataracts wherein the calcified anterior capsule is present you can see how i am doing the rexis in mature cataracts always trepan blue underneath the air bubble and then make a nice guide flap then inject viscoelastic don't fail to inject viscoelastic and then go with the capsular rexis forceps i feel in my my hands the capsular rexis forcer has got better control especially in a white cataract like this because you can have better control of the size as well as the shape of the rexis as well you can see here every 3 clock hours i'm catching the base of the capsular rexis flap there and concluding the tear from outside in making sure throughout the procedure the anterior chamber is deep this is the rexis in mature cataract is another patient you can see a rexis in mature cataract can see here this is intermittent cataract wherein the <coughs> the, uh, the this thing is uh, very high so i am trying to make a small opening there and then create a with a 26 gauge needle and decompress the anterior compartment and then trying trying to do the capsular rexis uh, uh, by going around every 3 clock hours come out or stay inside and catch the base of the capsular rexis again another patient with a fairly dense white cataract can see here how i am doing the rexis injecting viscoelastic <clears throat> and then going with the micro capsular rexis forceps and trying to catch that and going towards the center you can see that movement of the the instrument is towards the center of the pupil or centripetal and concluding the tear from outside in this you have to keep on repeatedly register in your mind when you are doing the capsular rexis it has to become secondary or even tertiary for you because this is the most important step in my opinion so capsular rexis in an intermittent cataract and this is the argentina flag sign intra capsular pressure in type 1 intermittent cataract and seizure argentina flag sign this argentina flag sign can be very dangerous 
Now, once you have an Argentina flag sign, the rexis can extend across the equator into the posterior capsule. You can see here I'm using a high molecular weight viscoelastic like viscoat. Despite that, because of the high interlenticular pressure, which is very common in type 1 intumescent or white cataracts, it is going to the periphery. Once you have a cataract like this, this is a fairly grade 2 cataract, it's not very hard. I'm completing the capsular excess by means of a semicircular capsular excess on one side and then making sure there are no flaps there and completing again with the capsular excess. On one side, I'm completing the semicircular capsular excess. Similarly, on the other side, also I'm completing that. So we have two semicircular rexes there with two tabs, one at 6 o'clock and another at 12 o'clock. The 12 o'clock is not very dangerous, but 6 o'clock will be very dangerous. I'm doing a direct chop technique. As I told you, this cataract is not a very hard cataract. It's a very hard cataract. Probably I will convert. I will show you a little bit uh, 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 a video a little bit later of that. And you can see here, I'm trying to bring that cataract up. Direct chop technique so that there is no stress on the zonules, no stress on the posterior capsule. Bring the cataract a little up into the iris plane, making sure that the corneal endothelium is well protected by means of viscoat and go ahead with the phaco emulsification without stress on the zonules and the capsular excess margin as on the, on the tone margin as well. And the patient did very well. This animation you can see shows this the is increased intralenticular pressure. intralenticular pressure from both the anterior and, and posterior, posterior aspects capsule. of an intumescent cataract, which pushes the lens forward. You can see here there is a pressure underneath the anterior capsule in an intumescent cataract. The nucleus is also bulky. There is a pressure in front of the posterior capsule, and there is also positive vitreous pressure. So basically, when you touch the anterior capsule, the pressure in front of the posterior capsule pushes the nucleus, which is very bulky, and that is the reason why you get the uh, Argentina flag sign in these cataracts. You can use a 27 gauge needle and aspirate the liquid cortex by making a small opening into the anterior capsule, and then once you reduce the interlenticular pressure. This will take care of the front compartment. Then you can go ahead with the capsular axis, but staining with the trepan blue, starting with the needle and then completing with the capsular axis ultrata forceps, making sure the anterior chamber is deep, and you can get a problem, a good capsular axis without any problem. Or you can use a 30 gauge needle also. You can even decompress like this the anterior compartment, as I told you making a small opening there and then continuing with the capsular excess forceps there and then making sure that you don't get an Argentina flag sign. But all these procedures take care only of the front compartment. The back compartment is still there or you can use if you have access to Zepto laser which is a nitinol ring which you have to introduce into the anterior chamber which is nothing but an electrical stimulation of the anterior capsule and you can go ahead with an anterior capsular excess without any problem in mature cataracts without producing a zinc or if you have access to the femto cataract like what we have then makes life easy in patients with the intumescent cataract like the catalyst rexis you can see here even then look for skipped areas and skip areas like this and making sure, but almost all, 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 all the time, you'll be able to get a good free floating rexis as well in this uh, intermissing cataracts. The puncture rexis is what I have described. A very simple thing, just put viscoelastic like HPMC, no heel on, no viscoat, go bevel down with the 15 degree, then punch the anterior capsule. And you can use a very high vacuum, 450, 500 millimeters on the Stellaris machine with the FACO power of about 50% or 60% continuous. And once you punch the anterior capsule, both the anterior and posterior compartments are taken care. 
and not only that because of the FICO multiplication given, the FICO power given, it debulks the nucleus also and you can see here the rexis becomes very easy and 200% of the time you will not get this Argentina flag sign. You can see here again these are the parameters I use in a puncture rexis, bevel down, just use simple HPMC. You don't want high molecular weight viscoelastic like viscoat or helon that will come and occlude the tip. Once you punch both the anterior and posterior, the, the anterior capsule, and same time you go all the way down on the FACO foot switch, that is a position three, then you can, uh, what do you call, uh, produce a certain amount of FACO and debulk the nucleus as well. And the rest of the, this thing becomes very, very easy. You can see here I'm punching. As I'm punching, going all the way down on the foot switch, I'm punching. And then not only punching the anterior capsule and decompressing the front and the back compartments, but also giving an amount of thicker emulsification, which debulks the nucleus and pushes the nucleus back as well. In this case, you can see here how I'm punching the anterior capsule. Same time, the FACO power, the energy, takes care of the nucleus also. You can see here, there is a debulking of the nucleus. The nucleus goes back and prevents the nucleus from coming forward. Same time, it decompresses both the front and the anterior component, posterior compartment. This is the FACO rexis, wherein with the FACO needle itself, we can do it. If you don't do the puncho rexis, if you do it tangentially and not vertically down, then you can end up in Argentina flax line like this. That is, you need to go vertically down in the punctorexis with the bevel down. If you go tangentially, then you can end up in a Argentina flax line like this in an intermission cataract. In a special situations like fibrotic anterior capsule, sometimes it is very difficult to do the capsulorexis. You can see here how I'm trying to do the capsulorexis. In the fibrotic anterior capsule, you can see this is a traumatic cataract. There is the fibrotic of the anterior capsule. You can see the anterior subcapsular fibrosis, which is there, which is coming along with that. Go always outside that the fibrotic area so that you can include the fibrotic area during the, cap, uh, 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 during the capsular axis. And you can see here how I'm trying to do that, going external to the or outside the fibrotic area and then completing the whole rexis starting with the needle and completing with the uterata capsular rexis forceps. Again, the hypermature cataract type 3, as I told you, calcified anterior capsule. Very difficult to do the capsular rexis. Sometimes you might have to cut with the vitreous scissors or the vana scissors. It can be very fibrotic, very calcified as well. I'm using the capsular rexis forceps. And these are the capsular axis which will never extend back. Like the, like the, uh, the type 1 cataracts, you can see here how I'm trying to do the capsular axis. Of course, staining of the anterior capsule is very important in these white cataracts. The staining has to be uniform. Always put an air bubble. In the area of the fibrosis, very difficult to do sometimes with the capsular axis forces itself. Sometimes you have to cut, as I told you, Either use a cutter or a vana scissors, or you can have to use a, the, the vitreous scissors as also. Lost rexis, escaping rexis. You can see here, this is another patient. I'm doing a hypermature intermission cataract. It is starting to extend subincisionally. That is the time wherein you can extend. You can see here, I'm putting viscoelastic. I'm using a microcapsular rexis forceps and trying to catch the base of the capsular axis and trying to pull it towards the center and retrieve the capsular axis without extending into the periphery as well. Hi, this is Tom Oding at the University this of Iowa. This is the Brian Richard technique. That Dr. Parley Fillmore did. You can see here, great once here it's Iowa. lost. He's doing a rexus and you can see that everything's going okay at first. But as he rounds the corner here, he begins to go radial. When the rexus goes radial, the most common spot to go radial. Normally, you have a tendency to pull it towards the same direction. You can see that right here, it's beginning to go out a little bit. So we place some viscoelastic, which is the best first step. 
just add a OBD to flatten the dome. See when it goes back in, and try to put the excess in the same direction. Capsule, which pushes it out a little bit more, and so he's even more radial. So here we're going to use the little capsule rexus tear out technique. So this is just show you the little rescue technique. As I'm doing the capsule rexus, you can see at six o'clock, the rexus is going towards the periphery. That is the radial extension is there. You can see the radial extension is there. So what I'm trying to do is if, I'm, if I do the same way, it will go to the periphery more. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to just pull in the, put the OVD there and pull the capsule rexus in the same direction. In the same direction as the rexus, same direction you can see here. As I'm pulling the same direction and the rexus is starting to come in. You can see here the rexus is starting to come in. And once it starts to come in, then I put some more viscoelastic and prevent the rexus from going into the zonular area and escaping and uh, the, the, uh, the rexus from getting lost. This is called the Brian Little Rescue Technique, which has been described by Brian Little from UK. It's one of the very good techniques which you can use, especially to prevent the rexus from going into the periphery, especially when it goes beyond the seven millimeter zonule, that is zonular area. Again, another patient with an excess rexus is extended. I'm trying to uh, uh, catch the rexus and complete the rexus by making a nick and trying to, can see here, and trying to pull it out inside and pull it out inside. You have to make, make sure that you pull it out inside and towards the center and making sure that you have a good viscoelastic as well. Just to show you a traumatic cataract with the previously Argentina flag sign because of a stick injury in a small fellow about eight year old and the, 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 the cataract was very soft. I just had to do an irrigation aspiration. You can see the two Flaps that is the on the on the anterior capsule, which is an Argentina flag sign, because of the stick injury, which is there on the anterior capsule. So went ahead with and did the the thing as I come out. Whenever there is a rexus tear, always inject viscoelastic and come out of the eye. And then I tried to convert one side of the pillar into a semicircular rexus, then another side into a semicircular rexus, and then I put a single piece lens into the bag. And the patient did very well. Just to show you again, a patient with a brown black cataract, you can see here, as I'm doing the rexus, the rexus is uh, uh, getting completed there. The patient had a coloboma also. As you know, the coloboma brown cataract, you can see here, uh, it's almost a black cataract, cataract of Niagara. The rexus is stone there and uh, I don't want to extend the, 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 the rexus there and it's, it's actually dangerous to continue with the black cataract with the toned rexus there. So what I did was I just to, uh, just to convert it into an uh, ECC, extended the incision, brought the, as you know, so saw that this cataract is definitely a very, very huge cataract as well, cataract of Niagara. Whenever there is a rexus tear in such types of gut rack, the take home message I want to give is to convert, don't have your ego in mind, always convert into an ECCE or an SICS and proceed with the FACO, proceed with the intraocular lens implantation. And otherwise, this gut rack will definitely go, the rexus will extend into the periphery. And another important thing is it will go, the rexus can and the, the nucleus can go into the vitreous cavity as well. The take home message is the FACO with the toned rexus, gentle or no hydro dissection, direct chop technique, iris plane anterior chamber FACO, inject viscoelastic into the AC through side port, convert to ECC or SSCs in case of brown black cataracts, depending on their experience. But my main take home message, all the beginners, is that if you're able to manage, up till grade two, grade three cataracts, you can probably manage with the tone rexis. Beyond that, I would suggest that you convert into 
so that you can avoid major issues. Now we go on to the second part of my topic, that is hydro dissection and hydro delineation. These are very important procedures as far as the phaco emulsification is concerned. The hydro procedures, the term which has been coined by Faust, developed by Michael Blumenthal. As you know, these hydro procedures can be hydro dissection or hydro delineation or hydro demarcation or hydro delamination. All three are the same as far as hydro delineation is concerned. Hydro dissection is different. What are the objectives of hydro procedures? The separation of the superficial cortex from the anterior fornicial and posterior lens capsule without losing the capsular integrity. Separation of the hardcore endonucleus from the epinucleus. That is the hydro delineation. Please know the anatomy of the lens. The anatomy of the lens has been revisited. The zone 1 is the hardcore nucleus or the endonucleus. The zone 2 is the epinucleus or the outer nucleus. Zone 3 is the superficial cortex. And then you have the capsule. So you have the capsule, the cortex, the epinucleus and the endonucleus which is forming the this thing and you have to separate each one of these from the other and that is what is the hydro procedures, the hydro dissection and hydro delineation. You have a 3 ml syringe or a 2 ml syringe, a piston which moves easily, BSS without air because you don't want the air to come and block, small, light and easy to handle, large size 25 gauge is preferable, I, I use the 24 gauge normally because I want to inject more amount of fluid in one bolus, able to deliver large amount of BSS, flat end with a load with a round with a hole there, with a smooth, smooth end as well, you should not be very sharp. 2 ml syringe with 2 cc fluid, prevent over inflation of the capsular bag, direct the cannula perpendicular to the excess margin, and then go towards the equator and then withdraw and then inject in one stroke. Lift the rexus edge, make a slight tent of the rexus before you inject in one full stream into the furnaces. Injection of fluid in the subcapsular plane <coughs> to separate the capsule from the cortex. You can have the cortical cleaving hydro dissection, which we normally do, or the conventional wherein you go underneath the cortex and separate the capsule and the cortex from the rest of the cataract. Hydrofree dissection, which is also described by gimbal, which is done by a spatula. This is a cortical cleaving hydro dissection, wherein the candela is, uh, is located underneath the capsule. So you make a tent of the capsule, go towards the equator, and inject in one stream and withdraw and inject in one stream. And then the cortical cleaving hydro dissection, wherein you go underneath the anterior capsule and the conventional hydro dissection, uh, that, is the, the, that is the cortical cleaving, the, the conventional hydro dissection, wherein you go underneath the, uh, uh, what do you call, the, uh, the CCC margin and the intracortical wave. And then, then we have the hydrofree dissection, which has been described by Gimbal, wherein with the spatula, it goes underneath the capsule and separates the, the capsule from the rest of the cortex and the rest of the cataract as well. What are the objectives and functions of the hydro dissection? Obtain complete mobilization of the nucleus, accurately evaluate the degree of the hardness of the nucleus, free the capsulocortical and corticonuclear additions. So the separation of the hydro delineation or hydro demarcation all are all the same, wherein the separation of the endonucleus is separate from the epinucleus. Normally, the hydro delineation is not done as a routine unless in certain situations like a posterior polar cataract or a traumatic cataract wherein we do only hydro delineation, we don't do hydro dissection. <coughs> it is identified by luminous gold ring a golden ring is there. Good separation allows the usage of high usage ultrasound in the central portion. So the epinucleus is separate from the endonucleus. The epinucleus acts as a very cushion while the nucleus is being removed. <clears throat> the procedure is done. 
injection is cl done close to the anterior capsule just inside the rexis 70 to 80% of hydro dissection achieved with the first hydro dissection remaining 30% is achieved with the second and third so multiple quadrant hydro dissection is always done decompression of the capsular bag is performed each time this is to prevent an acute capsular blowout syndrome and hydro rupture because you don't want the fluid to get accumulated between the nucleus and the posterior capsule and inflate the posterior capsule and blow out the posterior capsule and every time you do a hydro dissection a wave you see a wave you decompress or push the nucleus back into the bag and then go for the second and the third one mechanical rotation should follow hydro dissection check the hydro dissection to break the remaining adherence check the nuclear mobility inside the bag hydro dissection in the type of the nucleus grade 1 to 2 with sclerosis with good reflex easy hydro dissection diffusion wave is visible you can see the wave across the posterior capsule is a very safe procedure in a really dense cataract white cataracts brown cataracts you will not be able to see the red glow you will not be able to see the posterior capsule very clearly diffusion wave is not visible so you have to look for the other signs of hydro dissection good hydro dissection like the forward movement of the nucleus shallowing of the chamber and also the uh, the nucleus rotation as well the end point of hydro procedures in very dense cataract shallowing of the anterior chamber golden ring reflex in the hydro delineation free rotation of the nucleus is also there and the forward movement of the nucleus is also there all these are very important in a patient who has got a very dense cataract or a brown or a white cataract as well the diameter of the rexis small rexis easy penetration shifting of bases into the bag easy separation of the nucleus from the external cortex keeps the nucleus inside the bag larger rexis greater diffusion of bases in the ac and poorer hydro dissection greater probability of lens luxation subluxation into the ac greater dispersion of the cortex can also occur contraindications for hydro dissection intermittent cataract be careful you do not know whether there is an underlying posterior polar cataract post traumatic cataract integrity of the capsule may be lost irregularity in capsular rexis tearing of the capsulotomy as i told you in the earlier during the capsular rexis posterior polar cataract these are the contraindications for hydro traumatic cataract cataract post vitrectomy posterior polar cataract very dense hard brown cataract especially with a small rexis pseudo exfoliation be careful in doing hydro dissection nowadays we have multiple patients with multiple injections of avastin or lucentis be careful in doing hydro dissection just to show you the hydro dissection how the hydro dissection is going you can see here i'm going underneath the anterior capsule and injecting one wave decompressing the nucleus i'm going to another quadrant again every time i'm decompressing the nucleus into the bag i'm seeing the wave and then once you rotate the nucleus automatically the nucleus will start rotating another patient with the hydro dissection can see here i'm going underneath the anterior capsule creating a tent there inject in one stroke every time you decompress the nucleus don't forget to do that go to another cord and another clock hour and then inject in one stroke and every time you can see the nucleus coming forward decompress we don't do that then you can have an hydro rupture or acute capsular blowout syndrome again you can see here how i am doing this very beautifully and you can see that every time you can see this is a fairly dense cataract i am able to see the wave still grade 2 to grade 3 cataract but every time you do that you can see that hydro delineation can see here i am going at the junction of the nucleus and the epinucleus that is the endonucleus and epinucleus and look for the golden ring look for the golden ring it is a post patient with a posterior polar cataract look for the golden ring this is a fairly soft cataract most of the posterior polar cataracts are very soft cataracts i can see here where i am positioning the cannula in this case 
Again, you can see another patient with the hydrodelineation. When I'm going underneath, that is in the center. Whereas in the hydro dissection, I go underneath the capsular axis. Here I go into the center. You can see here junction wherein you can see the golden ring of the hydro delineation, which is very, very visible. You can see here the separation of the endonucleus from the epinucleus. As I told you, I don't do hydro dissection as a routine, but hydro delineation only for cases like chromatic cataract, cataract post vitrectomy posterior polar cataract, patients with multiple injections of this thing, patients with very uh, 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 dense cataract, be careful in hydro dissection. You can't do a hydro delineation because this nucleus is more nucleus and be, uh, you have to be very interesting about this. Also in a mature cataract, you don't have to do much hydro dissection because there's a good separation. Always make sure that you do a very gentle hydro dissection. Sometimes there can be an underlying posterior polar cataract and sometimes you do not see the wave and again very very important for you to understand you have, don't do, be very aggressive in doing hydro dissection. Soft cataracts like this in congenital cataracts I'm doing a capsular axis you can see here and then I'm doing a hydro dissection and then I'm doing a hydro delineation as well. Sometimes you can, when you're doing hydro dissection, when you're doing hydro delineation, you can have a accidental hydro dissection also. And this is a spring surgery. The objectives and functions of hydro delineation or delamination or demarcation is separate the internal compact nucleus with its inseparable lamella from the epinucleus. Evaluate the hardness of the cataract by evaluating the penetration of the cannula between the cortical lamellates and how well the BSS can separate the lamellae. Check the nuclear mobility inside the bag. Just to show you after hydro dissection, this is a fairly dense cataract. I'm doing the nucleus rotation. The nucleus has to rotate freely. The nucleus doesn't rotate freely like this. Don't try to rotate it very rapid, very uh, forcibly. You can damage the zonules in the posterior capsule and you end up in a problem of a nucleus drop. Complications during hydro procedures, extension of the rexis, threat to the bag, rupture of the capsule by fluid wave under pressure, prolapsing of the nucleus and at times the entire lens out of the bag. So all these can occur. You can see here, I'm doing a hydro dissection. And I'm doing hydro dissection as I'm injecting and keep on injecting without decompressing. I'm going ahead, as you can see here, there is a increase in the cap, the pressure underneath the nucleus and the capsular rex margin opens. This is a very dangerous situation because it's at six o'clock, wherein the maximum manipulation can occur and it can extend across the equator into the posterior capsule. And this can happen, hydro rupture, and sometimes it can extend posteriorly as well. And the posterior capsule can also get ruptured, and the nucleus can drop into the vitreous cavity. This is a hydro rupture, especially in a posterior polar cataract, you have to be very careful. Make sure the fluid wave, if the fluid wave crosses the center, it can have a PC rent during hydro dissection. Why the PC rent occurs during hydro dissection is that especially when you have a small rexis and a huge cataract, be careful in doing a hydro dissection. Don't be very aggressive. Always decompress the nucleus into the bag because you can have an acute capsular blowout syndrome. In the case of a posterior polar cataract, because the posterior pole is very weak, there can be a degescence of the posterior capsule, congenital, and the hydro dissection itself can open up the posterior capsule and within a millisecond, you can have the nucleus going into the vitreous cavity. The moral of the story is always look for the fluid wave in soft cataracts and shallowing of the AC in hard cataracts. Decompress the lenticular bag after hydro procedures, after every attempt. Never attempt hydro dissection in PPC and traumatic cataract and cataract post vitrectomy. So this is a message I wanted to give you. As far as the capsular excess and hydro procedures is concerned, 
these are the two important steps in my opinion to make sure that your fatal emulsification is successful i have stopped sharing the screen there and i am open to questions now dr lakshmi thank you very much for the wonderful yes. opportunity thank you sir that was an extensive and uh, all uh, I mean it was it had a very good coverage of all the procedures and i think most of the questions uh, we have prepared also has come under your talk so it makes my job easier so we have a few questions from uh, the uh, attending uh, surgeons so what is uh, the difference between uh, capsulorexus in a white cataract uh, versus a uh, white cataract that is femto versus manual rexus so what are the differences uh, between femto and manual rexus when you are doing in a white cataract that is the first question sir no no fem femto is a totally different ball game yeah. as i told you nowadays i am using femto only because i have access to femto uh, because it makes life easy and argentina flaxan is not a problem at all especially with the catalyst machine what we are having because it's a it's a very rapid technique of doing uh, decompressing the uh, the whole uh, bag where within a within a millisecond so that is the advantage of the femto so okay. you prevent the, the tags uh, the uh, the the thing in 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 the uh, the rexus uh, escape or the argentina flag sign in a, in a femto with a with a catalyst in a mature cataract but if you want to do it in a in a, in a manual as i told you all the precautions you can take like uh, you can use a punctorexis or you can use a decompress the anterior compartment by putting a 26 gauge or a 30 gauge needle and decompress the anterior segment and use high molecular weight viscoelastic or making what is called double spiral rexis make it making a small rexis and then extending the rexis and making into a double rexis so these are the things which you can um, uh, you can probably follow to prevent an argentina flag sign especially in the type 1 type of intermesen cataract Where the internal ventricular pressure is very very high. Okay, so the next question is: In a fibrotic anterior capsule, can the punctorexis be tried? Yeah, punctorexis can be tried in fibrotic anterior capsule also. That's not a problem at all, and uh, but it uh, it's not going to be of much benefit because in punctorexis, uh, what you do is you make a punch in this thing, but in the fibrotic anterior capsule, the problem is in the periphery. the periphery the calcified anterior capsule is there you might have to cut it and uh, only thing is the advantage of the fibrotic anterior capsule is that it doesn't extend like the routine uh, capsule it doesn't extend back because it's like a thick it's, it's like a thick wall there so it doesn't extend back so you don't have to worry about that okay so the next question is precautions in hydro dissection in femto second laser assisted surgery with the intraocular uh, intralenticular bubbles what are the precautions yeah. to be taken you have to be very careful because you have to cannot be very aggressive because already the gas produces a certain amount of hydro dissection so what we do is normally is go, go in and try to decompress the nucleus and uh, release the air bubbles from the posterior compartment as well and then gen do a gentle hydro dissection a gentle hydro dissection one quarter itself is enough in a femto that will take care of the problem already the gas produces certain amount of pneumo dissection as well okay so uh, the next question is uh, any advantages using a j shaped cannula in hydro dissection um uh, i have not used a j shaped cannula you can use a j shaped cannula because you can go sub incisionally but only thing is you can only to make make sure that you go through the main port never do a hydro dissection through the side port if you do through the side port the problem is the the interventricular pressure the pressure under underneath the pore underneath the uh, nucleus can go up and can have an acute blood so never do hydro dissection through the side port you can do use a j shaped cannula you can use a, a what do you call sub incisional that is uh, underneath the incision you can use it so that you can push the cortex from the sub incisional area to the other clock arms Okay, so so these are the questions which we got in the chat uh, box. So any of the panelists who can directly ask questions, I think that is possible in this. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, you uh, you have any questions? Any, 
Yeah, we have prepared uh, some questions actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. First of all, I, I wanted to know that uh, instrument, that micro rexus forceps uh, you were using, uh, yeah. the titanium instrument, it was like slightly longer and uh, it has a better leverage. Like what instrument is that? It's, is it a normal micro rexus forceps or is it slightly different? The, the titanium one, anyway. The titanium one, the micro rexus forceps is actually... Uh, Suha Saldipakas Microdosis Forceps, which okay. is made by the Epsilon company. Yeah, it is a okay. beautiful, uh, which, which can go through a 2.2 or 1.8 millimeter incision also. And uh, okay. if you want to use a side port one, then we have a different one, uh, which is uh, made by a number of companies are making that also. Even okay. Epsilon is making it, yes. Side port uh, micro rexus forceps. Like yeah, the usual problem with them, uh, yeah, side port, uh, usual problem is like, uh, when we use the micro rexus forceps through the side port, it gets hitched at that uh, junction uh, when you are using the regular micro rexus no, forceps the, through the side port. There are two port. micro rexus forceps. One you can use through the main port. There is a sukha saldi because you can use, yeah. uh, use the main port. The other one is a micro rexus forceps which is, made, which is uh, used to be made by the MST company. Okay. okay. But nowadays it's uh -huh. made by Indian companies like Epsilon and other companies are also making it. The Venu instruments okay. are also making it is a side port micro rexus forceps which can go mm. through a side you can go through okay. a side port I, I showed it in one of the uh, uh, videos there okay okay so yes. side port rexus forceps can also be used yeah okay sir. so we have two more questions from the chat uh, mm. how to trench in white morgagin cataract post debulking liquidized cortex as nucleus becomes small and more chances of uh, chatter I think uh, I mean, in it's outside the, yeah, outside the, more, I mean, like the session. Yeah. But, it doesn't matter. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Next week, we're going to talk about it. Morgag and cataract don't trench because there's no cortical cushion at all. There's no, because the nucleus will be, be very mobile. It's very difficult to trench. So what I do is I go in and go, go to the center, go bevel down, go to the center and do what is called a, uh, something like a horizontal chop or a, or a tangential chop. So just go engage the cataract because these cataracts are not very big. So the, the nucleus is a little small. Go to the center and then stop, uh, do a direct chop of these uh, cataracts. Right from the equator, you can chop it. So the uh, actually, it's something like a tangential chop you do for this Morgan Green cataracts. You cannot trench because Morgan cataracts, it's a very mobile, it's a very small. There's no cortical cushion at all. So... Uh, that's the question, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like post yes, debulking yes. liquidized cortex, the nucleus becomes small and more. Yeah, yeah it's okay. No, no. Morgan, and, you uh, cannot uh, do what? trenching. You straight yeah. away do the and chopping technique. Do you make any changes in the parameters when dealing with uh, such? Because sometimes the central part will be very thick. But if you put the parameters as... Uh, no, no. What, basically, four, any, any, any chopping for that matter which I'm going to discuss again next week, is any chopping for the matter, use very high vacuum. Anywhere between mm -hmm. 400 to 500 millimeters. So you need to hold, you need to hold the cataract. Holdability is directly proportional to the vacuum. So the uh, hold, hold the uh, cataract very nicely, then only you can chop. Because these Morgan cataracts are very small nucleus, but they are very, very, very thick like. The, okay. Yeah, yeah. Hard the, in the center and hard, uh, hard. small. Very yeah. hard, hard like. So hard in the center. Mm -hmm. So you need to yeah. do a chopping technique, use a sharp chopper and make sure that uh, you have a good viscoelastic like this coat to protect the corneal endothelium as well. Okay, so thank you. So the next question in the chat is uh, for uh, the ca capsular excess and intumus and cataract, which is more safer, the zepto or femto? <clears throat> Both are safe. Both are safe. Only thing is, the, uh, because I was using Zepto for some time uh, when he had a, a demonstration mission. The Zepto is, a, is an invasive procedure. Please understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of these intumescent cataracts, they have shallow AC also. Mm -hmm. And you'll not be able to put the Zepto in, in a ring inside That's the right. anterior chamber because the shallow anterior chamber and sometimes they can have phacomorphic glaucoma also. Whereas the Femto works wonderfully well in all these situations. That is the advantage. Thank so you. what you require even is a shallow chamber, the femto works wonderfully well and uh, you can get uh, almost 200% uh, of the time you can get a good rexus in the femto. 
my personal preference would be femto okay sir so femto. the next question femto sir is i think better than this thing okay sir. the next question yeah. would be um, and i think you have already covered it sir that in cases of extended ccc what are the ideal precautions to proceed with hydro procedures no i would not do any hydro procedures at all extended ccc if they if the ccc extended please do not do any, do any hydro procedure if you do any hydro procedure there is a possibility this this uh, tear can extend across the equator extend. into the posterior capsule gently do a, 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 a very gentle hydro dissection you can probably do away from that area not in that area away from that area you can do making sure that you just mobilize the nucleus and try to bring the nucleus up into the iris plane and try, try to do the phaco emulsification as i told you you would have it's a very soft cataract grade 2 grade 3 you can proceed with the phaco emulsification provided you have got good experience in doing this otherwise i would suggest that you convert if it's a very brown black cataract straight away convert okay sir. so i think uh, if anybody else has any questions to ask from the question and answer session um, visco dissection and posterior polar cataract please give your opinion that yeah, is another visco, visco dissection i used to do that visco dissection but i found that uh, Uh, if you do the hydro delineation without any hydro dissection itself is fairly good only thing is posterior polar cataract it is not only the hydro delineation but all other parameters also every time you come out of the eye you just inject visco elastic and come out of the eye use lower uh, phaco parameters do slow motion phaco and then reduce the bottle height don't use too much of visco elastic because that can itself open the posterior capsule and all these things uh, uh, thing are always used by manual techniques for irrigation aspiration so uh, all these i think are very very important as far as posterior polar cataract is concerned but visco dissection can be done uh, uh, if you are not very uh, uh, comfortable uh, with doing visco dissection you can just do a hydro delineation gentle hydro delineation if you are not comfortable doing that also you can just do a see what i am doing nowadays with posterior polar cataract i am doing going ahead and doing uh, more many of the posterior polar cataracts i do the femto i do the femto catalyst that makes life easy very easy because the capsular exercise is already done the nucleus is also cut into things i just have to go in i don't have to do any hydro dissection or anything i just have to go in and pick up the pieces because all these are soft cataracts and they come out very well so these are the messages i would like to give as far as the posterior polar cataract is Uh, so do you prefer this mechanical delamination uh, some people uh, advise this mechanical delamination instead of doing a hydro delineation uh, with the sinski mechanically separate the that's what, uh, uh, what from people the people uh, originally that yes, is called yes. the mechanical de- de- delamination with the spatula you can mm-hmm. do that all can do that also yeah okay yeah. Uh, another question from the chat box is how to emulsify a soft cataract cortical cataract again from soft the cataract topic, you know, yeah yeah next topic it will come but anyway i will uh, cover it up yeah. because the yeah. soft cataract is very soft cataract you just make a slightly larger excess about 5.5 mm you just do a good hydro delineation hydro dissection the whole cataract will start coming into the anterior chamber you can aspirate it that's the easier way of doing the soft cataract or if you want to do the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 most difficult thing are the in between cataracts or neither here nor not not there i call them nhnt cataracts the nhnt mm-hmm. cataracts are very difficult because these cataracts neither suck neither uh, crack neither chop yeah, crack. And so it's, it's very difficult to uh, manage these cataracts i'll talk about these cataracts next week okay so, so another cataract. question is uh, why hydro is contraindicated in post vitrectomy stay because in post vitrectomy size you do not know sometimes there can be inadvertent uh, touch of the posterior capsule during vitrectomy uh, and uh, zonules are weak and because you are going to the pars plana area zonules can be weak and uh, sometimes there can be touch of the posterior capsule and uh, all these can open up the posterior capsule sometimes you may not know that there can be a pre existing posterior capsule tear and if you try to do the hydro dissection they can open up the posterior capsule much more 
and then you can have the nucleus into the vitreous cavity. So you have to be a little careful. Nowadays we have patients who have got multiple injections of Avastin or Lucentis into the eye and repeated injections, you know, sometimes, sometimes these injections can, uh, the needle can touch the posterior capsule without the knowledge. Sometimes if the injections are given by the residents or uh, some beginner, they can, uh, uh, they, they can have a inadvertent uh, touch of the posterior capsule. You have to be very careful in these patients also. So always look at these patients, especially when you have patients who got developed cataract all of a sudden. That is, after injection, within one month, they developed a mature cataract. Okay? Before that, they are only PSC cataract. And within one month, they developed mature cataract. Always think of a touch of the posterior capsule, damage to the posterior capsule. Sure. So this, sometimes you may not be able to find out even on a B scan or a OCT uh, and uh, you'll be caught unawares if you do a hydroplasticity. Yeah. Sir, uh, another question from the chat is, uh, what are the precautions to take in rexus uh, in an anterior lenticonus? Anterior, anterior yeah, lenticonus. Anterior, anterior lenticonus is, uh, see, uh, the, uh, whatever anterior lenticonus I have dealt with is all in the, in the, the periodic Pediatric. cataracts. Okay. Yeah. You have to be, whatever uh, precautions you take in the periodic cataracts, the same precautions you have to take. Okay. As you know, the pediatric cataract, you are a pediatric ophthalmologist. So your mm -hmm. pediatric cataract, the, the rexis is very, very difficult. The capsular rexis is very difficult. If you aim for a 4 millimeter rexis, you'll end up in a 6 millimeter rexis. Six. Yeah. Okay. So you have to be very careful. So because it will keep on going to the periphery. And the same way, in anterior lenticonus also, you have to be very, very careful in that. So always use high molecular weight viscoelastic. I use, prefer to use the microcapsular excess forceps through the side port in these patients, in these children. Okay. Sir, and uh, do you prefer this uh, posterior capsular excess and posterior polar cataracts? Posterior capsular excess. Is very or... difficult to do a posterior polar. See, please understand in posterior polar cataract, in congenital posterior polar cataracts, it's like the, 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 there's a pre existing posterior capsular degasense. And if we see the degasins is not like a posterior capsule rent, it will be like two pillars on the, on the posterior capsule. It's very difficult to do a posterior capsule rexus. If you see the, uh, the videos, probably next week when I, I'm doing the posterior with the, the nucleus management, I will show you that also, where it will be like two pillars on the posterior capsule. Like two pillars on the posterior capsule. Yeah. Very difficult to do the, because it's a degasins. It's actually the posterior capsule is not there. Hmm. There. It's absent. It's a congenital degasins of the posterior capsule. So it's very difficult to do posterior capsular excess. Posterior capsular excess, when you can do, when you have a small posterior Black. capsular rent, when you have a small posterior capsular rent and you want, to want to, you want to put a lens in the back, then I would suggest that you convert that into a posterior capsule. It's easier to convert that into a posterior capsular excess, then put the lens. If you try to put the lens in the presence of a posterior capsular rent, without converting that into a posterior capsular excess, during the lens implantation, the entire posterior capsule can, can, can start extending can start and can have the lens in, in, the, in, the, in the vitreous cavity the very next day or on the, on the table also. So this is very, very important. So when you have a small posterior capsular rent, then you can convert that into a posterior capsular excess without any excess. problem. But not in a posterior polar cataract, oh, where it's yeah. like a two degasins, two pillars like that. Yeah. <laughs> so another chat uh, question is, what is the rate of uncut capsule and uh, run out in femtosecond laser in your experience? Absolutely nil. From whatever experience I've been using, uh, uh, I've done about 1200 eyes of uh, uh, catalyst laser now, since 2018 now. And uh, uh, absolutely not even one case uh, with the catalyst laser. With the catalyst laser, the, the catalyst is the best as far as the capsulotomy is concerned. I'm not saying because it's a J and J sponsored symposium or something like that, but um, I, I, I have used the, the Linsex also. Uh, I use the other machines also, but I'm saying the, the catalyst is probably the best as far as the capsulotomy is concerned because it's the fastest. It takes only 1.5 seconds for a capsulotomy or even less than that. So 1.5 seconds, which is the fastest. 
So even in a, in a, in a uh, intermission cataract, 1.5 seconds is a very re re reaction time. That is why my punctorexis works very well in intermission cataract because in the punctorexis, the needle is a little bigger. The FACO needle is much bigger than the 26 gauge or a 30 gauge needle. And because of that, it is able to decompress both the front and the back compartments of the eye very rapidly within a millisecond. millisecond. Because it's able to do that, the memory is very less uh, for, for, for these capsules to go to the periphery. Uh, so, uh, this uh, rexus size, do you alter it for soft cataracts versus hard cataracts? Do you prefer any sizes? Hard cataracts, in this I, I, hard cataracts I aim for about 5.5, 5.75. Because hard brown cataracts, because I want that uh, uh, space for my chopper and chopping with the, the vertical chop I do, when I chop right in front of the capsular rexus margin, I'm going to talk about the next week. But hard cataracts, I make slightly bigger rexus. In softer cataracts, I aim for about 5 or 5.25 millimeter. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, uh, sir, uh, in, do you use the soft shell technique in, uh, in tumescent or like which is the preference of uh, OVD in yeah, OVD soft shell? Like shell, 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 shell. Yeah, that's a, a different uh, subject altogether. But soft shell technique is uh, probably the way to go. Uh, the uh, soft shell technique is uh, especially for intermissive cataract, wherein you put viscose. Okay, or the dispersive viscoelastic, which will go and coat the endothelium. Underneath the viscoat, you put halon. So this, uh, in the, which case, you'll be able to uh, have a very good soft shell technique, which has been described by Steve Ashinov, and uh, that will uh, make the convex anterior capsule concave. So that is the idea. But despite all this, the interlenticular pressure, once you release the interlenticular pressure, once you release the pressure, once you make an opening in the anterior capsule, the pressure in front of the posterior capsule, the positive vitreous pressure. Now, all these white cataracts, what I do is I always do under block, unless otherwise the patient is a high myope. And I always put pinky and I give preoperative mannitol and diamox for these patients because I want to reduce the positive vitreous pressure. So I want to prevent all these things in you know, white cataracts altogether. Okay, sir. And uh, any tips for uh, rexus in the subluxated lenses and... Uh... Yes, traumatic, traumatic cataract. Traumatic in fact, cataract. I forgot to, forgot to mention that because we didn't have much time of that. Subluxated cataract, it's a different ball game altogether. Because in subluxated cataract, because in, in any rexis for that matter, you need to have a good resistance between the central capsule and the peripheral capsule. Okay? The central capsule is what you are making the flap. The peripheral capsule is what is remaining. Okay? So the resistance has to come from the peripheral capsule for you to make the central capsular excess flap. Okay, that is a normal thing. In a subluxated cataract, what happens is the peripheral because zonules are gone, the peripheral capsule has no resistance. So when you try to pull this central capsule, what will happen is the peripheral capsule also starts coming along with that. What I would suggest is I would do what is called a, a, a bimanual technique in a subluxated cataract. So whenever I have a subluxated cataract, I make a, in the area of subluxation, I put a capsular ring or even iris um, hook you can put wherever you have completed the resin and then try to, uh, what do you call, uh, do the capsular excess in the remaining part. So wherever I have completed, I try to put an iris resin which, so that, so that I, I'll pull that peripheral capsule to the periphery by the iris hooks or the capsular hook uh, um, uh, the capsular hook and uh, so that I have the good central resistance the, uh, the, uh, the resistance from the periphery will be there or nowadays what I'm doing is because I've got access to catalyst it makes life easier for me for me to do a subluxated cataract with the catalyst of the femto cataract which is very very easy only thing is in a subluxated cataract I decentrate slightly depending on the area of subluxation whatever it is so, but this is the way wherein we need to use a bimanual technique. If you have a bimanual technique, it's just like membrane peeling from the surface of the retina. If you have membrane peeling, if you have bimanual, then you will be able to peel the membrane much better from the retina. Similarly, we have bimanual technique of the capsular axis. So, uh, the uh, holding the axis in one hand and uh, pulling the axis with another one. Uh, so, the the uh, that makes the life very very easy mm -hmm. and always. The peripheral, if the zonules are very, very lax in that area, always make sure that you pull that area 
that the area of the capsular rex is wherever, wherever you are completed by means of an iris hook or a capsular hook. Okay, so is there any alteration in the incision uh, length or anything if uh, when you need a uh, rex is in an intumescent cataract or uh, subluxated like that, the incision of incision will produce leverage, like you get a better leverage if it's like the length of the incision is slightly different. So do you make any changes in that or like it's the standard one? Standard one, uh, the, the standard. length of the incision is the same, uh, more or less the same. Only thing is, Even the, if, uh, wherever the wherever the subluxation is, make sure that the incision is opposite that the area of subluxation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay. don't put it underneath the subluxation. And um, if it is a, I mean, if in regular fake off we get an eccentric rexus or uh, something like that, uh, like how do we manage that, or like does it matter about the centration of the lens? If it's too much Just of eccentric, then, yeah. then what I would suggest is wherever it is eccentric, you need, at the end of the surgery, you just put the lens and end of the surgery, you can, um, uh, you can just uh, you have to cut uh, the, with, with, with the vanas and then try to extend the rexus or make the rexus slightly bigger in that area. Yeah. Okay, so one of the, another question which is there is uh, people who are uh, familiar with the 26 gauge needle uh, capsular rexus uh, should we shift to forceps or uh, no. which would be the better whatever technique? you are comfortable whatever you are comfortable only thing is in certain situations like the wide mature cataracts or in a patient when we when when, when the rexus is going to the periphery or in a subluxated cataract I feel that uh, Woodretta forceps is definitely, micro rexus forceps definitely has got better control. Because you can have the feel of the rexus, whereas the needle, it is more or less like a pre-drawn, what do you call, uh, predetermined mm. course. Yeah. In a, in a regular case, in a regular mature, uh, immature cataract, whatever you're comfortable, whether it's needle or the rexus, doesn't matter. In a special situations, I feel the definitely a forceps makes a difference. Okay, sir, I think uh, the question, nobody is there in the chat, doctor, so anybody, they have any questions, I think, sir, uh, most of the questions I think you covered was in your talk itself, so yeah, yeah. we don't have much to ask. Thank you, thank you so much, Lakshmi, and uh, it's yeah, been thank a pleasure. You, sir. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure being with you. <laughs> Same here as well. Yeah. And uh, thank you again, J&J, &J. Raghu and Ashok are there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Raghu. Yes, sir. Ashok and Raghu. Uh, sir, I am aware. Yeah, Any I am more here. No, no, sir. Okay. Uh, we we come to the end of the session. From the session. Okay, sir. Yes, Thank sir. you very much for uh, being with us. And uh, we hope to see another uh, interactive and a very uh, like video filled session in the next week. Thank you, sir, for your presence. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, JNJ. &J. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Raghu, Ashok, Jashwinda, JNJ, &J, for the wonderful opportunity. See you again next Saturday, 3 p.m. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you.